Thanks for watching this special program, Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations, brought to you by Amazon Web Services. I'm your host, Francis Rose. We have a lot of ground to cover in the next 30 minutes, including what federal agencies should look for in a cloud computing platform, how risk management applies to cloud security, especially for risk-sensitive organizations, and the role of automation in data center migrations. So let's get right to it. Joining me first, Adelaide O'Brien, Research Director at IDC Government Digital Transformation Strategies and Laverne Council, the former Chief Information Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs, now National Managing Principal for Enterprise Technology Strategy and Innovation at Grant Thornton. Thanks uh, both very much for joining me. What, Laverne, are federal agencies looking for when it comes to cloud technology as they're thinking about transitions today? Well, I always relate it to an acronym that I created for myself to, to make sure I was looking at it the right way, and I call it RAS. They're looking for reliability, responsiveness, agility, and of course, some services, and ultimately security, security, security. Mm -hmm. um, the objective is to really have that kind of responsiveness, the elasticity that we need now in order to really be able to leverage the data that we have, but do it on platforms that are much more cost advantaged. Um, with the scalability of cloud, that's what most are looking for. Mm -hmm. Adelaide, how are we seeing cloud really reform and, and rejuvenate the way that agencies are meeting their missions? We're five or six years into the cloud revolution now. Yeah, so when you think about it, we, we, we call that digital transformation. And when we think about digital transformation, the, the first thing is basically leadership transformation within the agency. And, and that means that the leaders uh, of the organization really have to understand not only their, the, the mission and their strategic plan and how they're going to get there and share that with their cloud provider, but we're seeing even more importantly, the, the, the leaders need to understand the ecosystem that they operate in today and how that ecosystem will change in the future. Because that's really going to set up and enable then the right cloud uh, provider to help you help the agencies share that information while protecting identity, uh, use that information to make better data-driven decisions, mm -hmm. um, and really connect what today are programs and, and data silos uh, to drive, again, better decisions and to better serve citizens. Yeah, I think Adeline hit the nail on the head when she talked about the digital transformation is critical. The cloud is a heap of component of that, mm -hmm. but the reality, when we look at the new technologies that are now coming up, the no-code platforms that are now available, all those things didn't even exist three years ago. Mm -hmm. So having an understanding of the ecosystem is really critical to your ability to forecast your future and to make a decision on how you're going to digitize in the future. It's the cloud is a key component of it. It's now the platform that lays on top of that great network that everyone forgets about. But ultimately, thinking about your ability to leverage the partners around you is key. Well, as a matter of fact, Laverne, you know, when we think about, and actually our definition of digital transformation involves leveraging third platform technologies, such as big data, mobility, social business, and they all sit on the cloud platform. Mm -hmm. And it's about government changing the business of government to really be much more responsive to what citizens need and providing constituents you know, information that's almost real time and making much better data-driven decisions. So Adelaide, to that point about that you made earlier about um, leadership, that's one of the biggest elements when you talk about changing the way that, that business is conducted. That's one of the biggest things I think that is important to note here. And I, Laverne, I wonder if you saw this, but it strikes me that the, the cloud transformation and the, and the kind of the maturity of the cloud model and its appeal to government agencies. This is the first big technology transition that's really required uh, leadership buy-in other than just the technology offices. In, in years past, um, some new technology would come along and it would kind of be left to the folks in the tech shop to worry about. That's not the way that these transitions will happen successfully, is it, Laverne? No, you know, it's not. It is a partnership between the CIO and the rest of the agency. It has to be because there has to be a critical understanding of we are now doing something with another partner, we're leveraging another platform or another service or another infrastructure, and what we have to be prepared to do is to ensure that everybody understands that, that they understand that we're managing all security risks, PHI, PII, but at the end of the day, we need to scale. We can no longer hope that our own bricks and mortar can give us the business continuity that we need, mm -hmm. the security that we need, and also the agility that's so critical. Um, Adeline said it correctly when she said, you know, our constituency, the public, 
really looks for us to be cutting edge and used to the technology they're using every day. So within government, you also have to be prepared, and that means it's a partnership now. It's not just the CIO. Mm -hmm. that you know, I was just going to mention, Francis, too, you talk about one of the first major technologies that's actually changed government, and it's, and it's actually bigger than a technology. And when you think about what cloud can do, first of all, it's the leadership, and the culture has to change from one of really asset management to, as Laverne said, having the, the IT and the CIOs really understand what the outcomes of the agency mission are. And then, when you, then, then cloud can enable all kinds of things. It can enable, we've talked about citizen services, that's a very key one. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about some of these more innovative technologies like machine learning, you know, cloud can enable that. And then you know, your, your CSRs can, can, can leverage chatbots and that helps them really you know, offload some of those mundane questions about the latest rules, the regulations, and, and some of the citizen transaction history and, and give citizens 24-7 uh, self-service, if you will, but but it also then enables some of those CSRs to to do higher level uh, skills in, in terms of solving higher problems. It also enables other efficiencies through email and you know collaboration tools, which you, as you know is is a big push of IT modernization. Adelaide, the Laverne referenced scalability a minute ago, and it sounds to me like that's an important aspect of all of the th things that you just mentioned. The ability to use as much or as little capacity as an agency needs at any particular time. Is that's it fair right. to say? Yeah, that's right. And, and do that without tying up government resources to manage, uh, you know, and, and to really maintain the, those, those resources. And, and when you think of scalability, it is to support all the things we've talked about, but also some of the agencies that have cyclical requirements uh, or they have a lot of DevOps going on at peak times uh, or those who have uh, deadlines for benefit enrollment. Uh, think about close to the, the end of the, the, the deadline where they might need some, some extra capacity to process all that. So, you know, scalability in government can, can help not only, you know, enhance its mission, allow citizens to communicate with government when they want to and how they want to, uh, but also really helps with a lot of that employee productivity. I want you to put on your agency CIO hat for yeah. a moment, Laverne, and help me think through the balance when you're thinking about a, a, and planning for a cloud transition, the balance between economy and agility, the attributes that you want to make sure that you have, and security and compliance and reliability. They're must-haves in a cloud that's, environment. That's correct. I, when you think about it, the, the bottom line with the cloud or anything that becomes a utility is to do it better, faster, cheaper, right? So that you can have the resources to put in place the real needs, the application needs, the, the solution needs, right? And you want to be able to offset your costs in a very fungible way, but you never, ever, ever give up on having the right controls and security. You can't, especially when you're leveraging others' data and especially when you're doing processes that others are counting on. So the balance you talk about is a constant risk management mm -hmm. that every CIO has to take on. You have to decide you know, risk versus value, risk versus capability. And when looking at the, most of the cloud providers today, they understand that. They, they understand that they're taking someone else's um, um, collateral, somebody else's asset, and they have to manage it like it's their own. Um, and sometimes you are able to get a better platform with better security that way. Um, so I think the, the first thing you do, you never take the trade off on the security. You never take the trade off on the controls and compliance. What you do is you try to get as much as you can for as, as the dollars that you have mm -hmm. to provide as much agility as you need. Adelaide, what are those must have safeguards that agencies really need to be looking for as they're making these decisions? So when I think of safeguards, I think agencies should think about future proofing their cloud decisions. Mm -hmm. And you know that means taking a look at, at some of the vendors who are offering you cloud today. And, and you, know, you talk about security, Laverne. We've got almost a hundred who have actually gone through the FedRAMP yeah, process yeah. And, and offered uh, you know those security controls. But but we are as agencies also take a look. What is that cloud vendor investing in R and D? And are they starting to invest in what we call innovative technologies, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. cognitive computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence? And, and then as they invest in those and they launch them commercially, how fast then are they getting those through the FedRAMP process so that government agencies can leverage that technology as well? The, the other thing to look at, and, and I think this is very important, 
is how are they bringing in commercial, not only technology, best technologies, but also commercial best practices. And you know, are they giving you reference clients uh, from the commercial sector, mm -hmm. not only about the technology that they're using, but the outcomes that they're ac actually able to achieve with that technology. Adelaide O'Brien, Laverne Council, thanks both very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for Thank you very much. Good to be here. Cloud computing's impact on government operations has also resulted in a greater focus on cybersecurity and IT risk management. John Wood, Chairman and CEO of Telos, joins me next. You're watching Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations. Don't miss the AWS Public Sector Summit, June 20th and 21st at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center in Washington, D.C. Join global leaders from government, education, and nonprofit organizations and learn how to use the cloud for complex, innovative, and mission-critical projects. Hear keynote speaker Teresa Carlson. Attend hundreds of breakout sessions, boot camps, workshops, and more. Register today at aws.amazon.com slash dcsummit. Brought to you by Telos. Solutions that empower and protect the enterprise. Welcome back to this special program, Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations. I'm your host, Francis Rose. Moving IT infrastructure to a private sector cloud creates a model of shared responsibility. It can relieve an agency's operational burden, but that transition also requires a renewed focus on cybersecurity and IT risk management. Let's pick things up there with John Wood, Chairman and CEO of Telos Corporation. John, thanks very much for joining me once again. What does the landscape look like for agencies now from a cybersecurity perspective, and how is that landscape changing on an ongoing basis? So, really happy to be here today again with you, Francis. I think the main thing is, you know, we've been watching the Verizon Data Breach Report. This is their 11th year. The 2018 report's just out. And what we see is the, the sheer amount of phishing attacks that are going on out there. Now, earlier in this segment, one of the guests was talking about the need to protect identities. And I think a key way to be able to do that is making sure that at our agency level, we're, we're using more things like multi-factor authentication, because in the end, those data breaches will continue. Having things like multi-factor authentication really stymies the, the uh, competitive threat. You really only need one person in your organization to give away credentials to really mess things up for the entire operation. And we've seen from these phishing attacks that in many cases they're a lot more successful than one, a lot more uh, people than one give up their credentials. What makes that work on the other side so that whatever somebody can obtain through a phishing attack is not all they need to get into a network or to access the wrong kinds of information? So there are two points there. First and foremost, people need to employ training strategies internally because phishing is just going to get bigger and bigger. But the second point is when you have multi-factor authentication, even if someone's given up their credential, you need something else to indicate that you actually are who you say you are. That something else might be a, 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 an, al an alarm on your, on your iPhone, as an example. So there is a very simple set of, set of tools that are out there that people can use to defeat that threat. And I've found, even in my personal life, that as time goes on, they get easier and easier to use. I tried to log into my bank's website today from my computer here at the station, and it's not a place that I normally do that. And it was just as, as, as simple a matter as receiving a text on the cell phone that I have, which is on file with my bank, and I was able to do what I wanted to do. That's not information that would be easily obtainable by somebody who fished me, even if I did give them other stuff, right? Absolutely correct. That is exactly why multi-factor authentication is, is working as well as it does. And again, it's, it's not a... Uh, it's, it's not hard to implement, and it's not very expensive to implement, but it is very effective. One of the key tenets of the NIST cybersecurity framework is a risk management approach. What does that mean in 2018, and how has that kind of vision changed over the years? So when the president signed the cybersecurity executive order mandating the NIST cybersecurity framework, what it did for all the security professionals out there was it gave a common language within which people can work within. It provided also a common set of controls so that as, as the earlier guests discussed, needing to have a rigorous set of common controls is very, very important from a, from a security risk management perspective. And then applying automation to make sure that that security and automation and compliance activity does not interfere with the mission owner's activities.
We have about a, a minute and a half left, and I'm curious, you talked about the fishing explosion earlier in our conversation, and I'm wondering if there was a way to have anticipated that, not just simply for looking back and contemplating what's already happened, but how thinking about what the next big challenge that we talk about a year or from now, or two years from now, or five years from now, might be in order to protect uh, networks better yep. uh, in anticipation of what somebody, the bad guys, might try next. So I think the holy grail from a security and compliance perspective is to move from a point in time as it relates to evidencing that you're providing a, the body of evidence that you're, that you're operating in a secure way to what's called a rolling or a continuous authority to operate. That to me makes the, the evidence much more relevant to the operational security professional and it makes it much more expedient for the mission owners to actually get to the cloud. You mentioned the term uh, continuous authority to operate. That sounds similar to a CDM or continuous diagnostics and mitigation strategy, but it's probably not exactly the same, right? Correct, sir. It, it, in, the, in the end, what this is, is it provides the operational security professional with near real-time updates as to how their underlying security posture is changing, which again, keeps it, keeps it fresh and makes it relevant. And that's why in the end, it's the holy grail. Final thought, what are the things that you will watch the most as all of this evolves in the coming weeks, months, years, to see which direction that you would like to help agencies go? Well, first and foremost, every single agency is really pushing hard down this path. Whether you're talking about the Fed Civ side with the DHS, or you're talking about the Department of Defense, or you're talking about the IC with the C2S program. So in the end, I think I've seen for the first time at the administration level to support, at the legislative level of the support, and most importantly, within each of the agencies so we as taxpayers can feel protected. John Wood, thanks very much as always. Thank you, sir. The future of federal cloud security also depends in large part on FedRAMP, the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. We'll talk cloud consistency and confidence with Didi Doskalu, the CEO of Stratus Solutions, next. So keep it right here on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Brought to you by Stratus Solutions. Cloud governance best practices to accelerate compliance around the enterprise. FedRAMP is a government-wide program that provides a standardized approach to security assessment, authorization, and continuous monitoring for cloud products and services. The program's designed to bring consistency and confidence to federal cloud computing. Here, we dig into FedRAMP and other issues of governance. Joining me, Didi Daskalou, CEO of Stratus Solutions. Didi, thanks for coming on the program. What guideposts do federal agencies have regarding governance? How should they think about governance as the, these cloud transitions are happening? Right, so um, in 2011, the White House um, released this uh, Cloud First policy aimed to uh, increase uh, cloud adoption across the federal government. Um, at the time, the Office for Management and Budget estimated about um, a quarter or so of the $80 billion federal IT budget was a candidate for uh, cloud transformation. Uh, that number has climbed ever since, um, and uh, because of this policy, uh, cloud adoption of cloud service providers has increased as well. So since then, uh, C2S came out, uh, sponsored by the CIA, which was the intelligence community's cloud. Uh, and currently, we have this uh, multi-billion dollar uh, JEDI procurement looming for the Department of Defense cloud. So this um, increased cloud adoption has started to show some uh, issues with uh, cloud at scale, uh, specifically making sure that um, uh, consistency of how accounts are accessed is maintained, uh, budgets are enforced so that uh, contracting officers don't run afoul of the um, Anti-Deficiency Act, uh, and a security posture is maintained so that these compliance regimes like FedRAMP and the DOD SRG um, are kept in check. So uh, essentially a uh, good compliance regime consistent of uh, account access, budget enforcement, and compliance automation, ideally aligned to an organization's hierarchy. You used a term there that I want to get a definition of uh, quickly because I think it's important uh, to understand the terminology. Yeah. That's the term cloud at scale. What does that mean in the context of this conversation overall? Um, so cloud at scale um, means taking into account um, uh, a situation where a, a certain organization's needs are reaching a certain level uh, where growth and um, uh, shifting mission kind of occur. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, um, a good governance program is usually underpinned uh, by a uh, well-designed cloud infrastructure. Uh, so for example, some elements of an infrastructure like this include um, access points and ways to access these cloud elements. 
um, a security regime that basically helps with um, log aggregation and management, um, a network strategy to interconnect all these cloud accounts, and also a well-defined certification accreditation policy that accelerates um, approval to operate. Um, also, I would say for governance at scale in recent years, um, there's a multi-account strategy that has come about, uh, meaning that um, we're using cloud account boundaries to isolate individual project tenants. Um, and the uh, advantage to this is that um, developers and IT staff um, uh, can exercise the full power of the cloud, but at the same time, a blast radius is reduced um, so that we uh, shrink the amount of damage an individual tenant can do inside of a larger environment. When GSA first rolled out FedRAMP a number of years ago, right. the, um, the two of the reasons that they gave for it being important then were consistency uh, in, the pro the, in, in the security that's being offered and confidence that the agency could have that if they adopted somebody that was uh, FedRAMP compliant, they would know they could have confidence that they were getting a security regime that was going to work for them. Have those two held, and what are kind of the state of the art today as far as why compliance regimes like FedRAMP work well for agencies? Yeah, absolutely, so um, uh, FedRAMP, like you mentioned, is a government-wide program that's supposed to uh, ensure accreditation consistency, um, authorization, and continuous monitoring of cloud products. Um, actually, to make things a little bit more confusing, the Department of Defense um, uses a slightly different but similar standard called the uh, Cloud Computing uh, uh, Security Requirements Guide, the DOD SRG. Um, a cloud service provider like Amazon um, usually abides by both at various levels, uh, so they position themselves um, such that their platform and services can be used by workloads of multiple classifications. Um, and as you mentioned, this has introduced significant accreditation consistency. It's increased buyer confidence, especially in the federal government. Um, and um, it has also dramatically reduced the amount of time it takes to procure cloud. Um, one interesting fact, though, is that the fact that a CSP like Amazon has a certification like this doesn't absolve customers for practicing good security and um, compliance on their workloads. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon calls this the uh, shared security model, where uh, Amazon is responsible for the security of the cloud while their customers are responsible for the security and compliance of the workloads in the cloud. We have about 20 seconds left. What should agencies be doing on their side of that to ensure that uh, their, their third-party cloud service is meeting all of those responsibilities? Automation is key. In order to achieve the promise of better, cheaper, faster, like your previous um, guests mentioned, you need automation, not more humans or more uh, manual processes. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, 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 essentially the, um, the, the, the gist of that. Uh, these automated tools also need to not just um, report um, and observe, they need to enforce rules and act based on predefined uh, thresholds and boundaries. Didi, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll shift our focus from cloud governance to data centers. Next, you're watching Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Brought to you by RainCloud. Accelerating secure and compliant enterprise cloud adoption. We're back to wrap up this special program, Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations. DevOps can really grease the wheels in a cloud computing environment. It helps to identify bottlenecks between various threads of execution and codifies key modules that allow them to work better together. Here to build on that point, Sri Vazaretti, president and co-founder of Rain Cloud. Sri, thanks very much for coming on the program. What does the term DevOps have to do with federal cloud computing, public sector cloud environments? Thank you for having me. Um, DevOps is a culture of continuous innovation. It's customer-centric innovation, innovating in small batches with continuous feedback. It's, uh, it's what successful companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google have followed um, to innovate quicker. What's the intersection between that and the challenges that agencies find, uh, agencies in the public sector and other organizations, in trying to innovate during these cloud transitions while at the same time having to m continue to meet the missions of the agencies through these systems that they're modernizing? I think the biggest challenge is the compliance and security. Um, the cloud providers have successfully been able to solve majority of the elities, the non-functional reliability, scalability, but the compliance is still a bottleneck 
because it is a multi-step process with a um, you know with a checklist mindset that is there and it's harder to automate mm -hmm. which we are trying really hard to automate uh, but it's I think that will continue to be a challenge for a while. The other modernization element that's important here as we think about cloud is data center consolidation and migration and there are a lot of agencies that are starting to think about whether the capacity that they have in their data centers is necessary moving forward. What does that look like from a DevOps perspective, that consolidation and, and transition transformation process? Uh, I think cloud helps a whole lot in that sense. Um, the Department of Defense recently put out a uh, functional requirements document called uh, Secure Cloud Computing Architecture, which essentially provides the government a way to look at cloud as their virtual data center with a lot of capacity and a lot of um, agility, scalability. So it's much easier now to try to move, have parallel environments running. So the consolidation effort has become much easier. And then you can take a little bit more risk in trying to modernize the applications as a part of making this move without being worried about all the all the elites. What's the role for automation here as agencies are trying to do all these things? As I said, one of the key challenges that agency leaders tell me about all the time is I've got to modernize a system at the same time that I've got to keep it going in order to be able to push out whatever citizen service is being provided. So how, what's, what's the role for automation here in your view? I think it's been a general theme uh, that all the guests have been touching on. Uh, continuity and automation is, is really what is um, the best that the cloud providers have op, uh, offered because they have allowed this automation by exposing what is known as APIs, the application programming interfaces, which we can have machines drive the workflow steps. By applying uh, machines to do this, um, you know, people can now focus their expertise on what they're good at, the talent. Mm -hmm. and People cannot work 24 by 7, whereas machines can work 24 by 7. So automation really helps in achieving that efficiencies. There is a data deluge underway in government, of course. We talk about it a lot. And the challenge that that is providing is there's more coming in than people are able to sort through. Uh, they can only analyze, defense agencies and intel agencies tell me, what they're, uh, a small fraction of what's coming in. How can they maintain scalability and flexibility in a cloud environment in the midst of that kind of a deluge tree? Right, so the, one of the things that the automation offers is the ability to um, have the factory model. Um, and the factory model, where they look at both from an application manufacturing process as well as the data manufacturing process. And if you look at the data manufacturing process, there's data of different kinds, real time, batch loads of data, cleansing data, transforming data, and being able to, the nature of data is such that, let's say if you take pictures, photographs, the immediate pictures that you want to show people, the good ones that you like, you may leave them on your phone, some you leave on your laptop or disk um, in your house, or some on the cloud. So the cloud providers make it very easy to be able to store a lot of data at scale, but also retrieve the data that you need so you can be agile about performing these analytics and analysis to, to accomplish your mission. Sri Vazareddy, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for watching this special program, Security in the Cloud, Government Innovations, brought to you by Amazon. For more information on this program, go to govmatters.tv slash AWS.